Hi everybody, welcome back to Audrey Approved. Today I wanna to go over um, a few book recommendations and books that I wanna read um, under a specific subject. And that subject is nonfiction books about ancient history, which I recognize is a little bit random um, and uh, kind of out there. But, you know, I, I really enjoy nonfiction and I wanna make more content about nonfiction books because I read, you know, a third to a half of what I read is is nonfiction. I want I want that to be reflected here, um, and I find that I will typically read in these little subject islands. So I'll I'll find that I'm really into ancient history. I'm really into linguistics. I'm really into um, um, evolutionary biology, right? And so I'll jump from kind of subject to subject, and then circle back again um, and so I want to have maybe a little series where I go through some of these little subject islands and books that I'm eyeing books that I've read books that I've heard about you know stuff that I um, that I think might be interesting and, and maybe you too if you have interest in that subject or if you're just browsing around for something new to read so the two ancient history books that have to do with Egypt that I wanted to cover are both by the same author they're by Kara Cooney and Kara Cooney is a professor of Egyptology, and she's written quite a few popular, actually popular history books about specifically women in ancient Egyptian history. I think one of the things that is really fascinating about um, ancient Egyptian history is just how big of a time span it covers, right? So um, Cooney's covering um, women that lived like 4,000 years before the common era, right? And so Egypt as like an, uh, a superpower, an ancient history superpower lasted for thousands of years, which is really hard to imagine because you think about like America, for example, we've only been around for 250. And so in this first book that I read, it's called um, When Women Rule the World, Six Queens of Egypt. Um, Kara Cooney covers six different queens or pharaoh queens um, covering a whole bunch of different dynasties and across the centuries and some of these might be familiar you have like cleopatra or um, hatepshit or nefertiti but then there are a few uh, a few more that maybe you haven't heard of such as um, tuasaret um, there's one that i can't remember and um, mernith and you know i think what's really interesting is that for such uh, such an ancient culture that's so seeped in tradition, what were the situations that allowed these women to come and rise to power and really rule over, you know, the world's greatest superpower um, at the time? I think that's a really interesting question and she tries to lay out the political and religious and cultural um, settings that allowed these women to make their way to um, positions of extreme power. Kara Cooney narrates these books herself, and I think she's a really fantastic narrator. She manages to kind of bring the world of ancient Egypt to life, um, and she does this by adding in phrases such as, you know, Hatepshut might have thought this, or Nefertiti could have been afraid of this. And some reviewers, when I was like scrolling the Goodreads, had a lot of problems with this. They just thought that, you know, a historian shouldn't, you have to use the word might or could have. But, you know, when your subject matter is from thousands of years ago and there's so little data to work off of, I actually really appreciate authors that add in that kind of hu humanistic element to the storylines. I think some people would say that it borders on fiction rather than nonfiction, but I think as long as an author makes it very clear, you know, chooses the words might have or could have, I'm okay with this, especially when it comes to books about ancient history, books that are, you know, much, much closer to our current time period. I, I don't, I'm, I'm really not okay with that. Um, but for a book like this, I, I, I enjoyed that kind of aspect that Cooney added. While The Six Queens of Egypt covers, um, you know, six different female pharaohs across, across the ages, um, her other book, The Woman Who Would Be King, Hatepshut's Rise to Power in Ancient Egypt, covers just one woman, Hatepshut, and her, um, her astronomical rise to power and her subsequent 
fall. This is uh, a pharaoh queen who ruled as co-regent with her nephew, and when she was replaced in power, a lot of her images were removed from, you know, hieroglyphics and temples, the main places where Egypto Egyptologists get a lot of their information. And so I thought it was uh, a really interesting uh, deep dive into, you know, what were the politi ma political machinations that she had to go through, um, how did she, how did she kind of, um, uh, take over religious aspects of the country and, and make herself indispensable. Um, I really enjoyed both of these books. I think Kara Cooney really brings these women to life in her books. I will I will note one thing though is that Kara Cooney likes to make um, analogies to modern political leaders, and including uh, political figures like Hillary Clinton or Elizabeth Merkel. Not Elizabeth Merkel. Merkel's last name, the, the German Chancellor. Um, and I do find her commentary talking about these women a little bit jarring, I won't lie. Um, it kind of brings you out of like the ancient history setting. Um, but in both of these books, it's not a huge aspect of the actual content. It's maybe like a paragraph or two across the entire book. Um, and so I think that quite a few reviewers don't enjoy this. And Kara Cooney actually has a new book that's come out. I think it's called The Good Kings. I don't I don't remember the sub the subtitle on it. And it has some atrocious reviews on Goodreads. It's down in like the two stars, I think, um, because I think she makes a lot more political commentary um, about American politics, and she definitely leans. Um, pretty pretty blue in her in her analysis of it. So that's just a flag in case you really don't enjoy that in your nonfiction. I still like her books. I still enjoy them. I do find it maybe a little bit annoying at times, but I get why she's trying to do that. Um, but overall, I really enjoyed these. And if you have an interest in ancient history, especially women in ancient history, check these two books out. On the subject of women in power, I want to cover one more book on, on that subject, and that would be The Dark Queen's um, the Bloody Rivalry That Forged a Medieval World by Shelley Puhok. This is about two ancient Merovingian queens. It's from the 6th century. Um, Fredegund, who was a slave who rose to power, and Brunhild, who was a Spanish princess, and their kind of rivalry across their lives. This reminded me very much of Circe from Game of Thrones. I think if you really enjoy her character and her storyline in, in the shows or the books, then you might enjoy this as well. You know, these women were bloody and ruthless and, um, you know, no holds barred to get their children and their families in power. And I think it's a really fascinating kind of tug of war between the two women to see um, who could outsmart who. Um, I did really enjoy this book. I think one thing I would note is that the author here doesn't toe that line between fact and fiction as well as I almost wish that she would. She does ascribe certain thoughts and feelings to um, these women without having really the ability to 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 say those things. Um, I think in some cases she she cites um, first-hand sources like diaries or um, or treaties or things like that, but very frequently she she assigns thoughts and feelings to women, and, and the author really can't know what those women are thinking at that time and. She doesn't say things like might, she says, Fredigan thought this. And so I find that a little bit frustrating, which is why I only gave this, I think, three stars rather than what I gave the other the other books, which are four or five. Um, but at the same time, I did, I do recognize the difficulty of telling a story about women who don't have a lot of first-hand sources from, you know, over a thousand years ago. You know, I do think that if you're going to read this, you should read it with your eyeballs and not your ears like I did, because the, the book itself has, like, timelines and family trees and, and maps that I think could have been really helpful in, in understanding and keeping track of all of the political players here. But overall, I thought this was pretty interesting. If you don't know anything about the Merovingian dynasty, I know I had never really heard that word except for, I think, the twins in the Matrix, right? Aren't they called the Merovingian twins? Um, and so if you, if you have an interest in that subject matter, or again, how women take control of, um, of, uh, of a society that is very heavy on the patriarchy, then, you know, you can you check this one out as well. Next up, I want to talk about um, the end is always near apocalyptic moments from the Bronze Age collapse to nuclear near misses by Dan Carlin. Dan Carlin is a podcaster. Um, he has a podcast called Hardcore History, which he's had for, I think, over a decade. I 
am not a podcast person. <laughs> I don't actually really like podcasts, but I have listened to Hardcore History a little bit um, in the car uh, on road trips. And, um, you know, Dan Carlin really likes to bring, he likes to go into really extreme detail and bring a lot of these historical events to life. And so this is his, his first book, um, which covers um, situations where civilizations ended. But Dan Carlin starts out, you know, he starts out this book in the introduction talking about how he doesn't really have like a point for the book or he's not trying to make like a thesis. And I think that really shows <laughs> because it does feel a little bit all over the place. Um, he covers pandemics, he covers um, nuclear, nuclear Armageddon, he covers um, the barbarians, he covers um, the ancient city of Nineveh. Um, and it did feel really random and really kind of hopscotch as he moved through all these different kind of subject matters. I found some of the some of the chapters in this book just like incredibly boring um, and, and exactly what you would think of when someone groans about a history book and a history book being boring. But why I'm including it today and why I want to talk about it a little bit is because there are some chapters in this book, especially in the first half of the book, where Dan Carlin talks kind of about like meta history. So he talks about why as we, you know, in, in 2020s think, you know, when we think about history, we are influenced by our cultural norms and the views that we have now and how that provides this like inherent limitation on how we view and look at historical civilizations and historical peoples. He gives an example with childbearing or child rearing where, you know, um, from our point of view, if you married off your daughter at the age of 11, um, when she first gets her period, then that seems like child abuse, right? That seems really horrible. You shouldn't do that. But from the point of view of people living back in those times, that was that was normal. You were giving your child like a good life, right? And so we view those people as like bad people or like cruel people or uncivilized people. But you know, when these people lived in their actual time periods, they might have been like the height of their civilization. And so these types of like meta discussions on what it means to think about history are why I, I really appreciate this book and I've actually bumped up my rating of it because over time I've thought about it more and more. And so I think if, th if that seems interesting to you, then you should check it out. If you like hardcore history, then you might enjoy this book as well. Um, the tone is very conversational in, in the actual writing, which Again, not my favorite, um, but I did feel like I got something from this piece, and so I did want to quickly mention that as well. And then it might not be an ancient history um, subject matter uh, video <laughs> without talking about uh, Sea People, The Puzzle of Polynesia by Christina Thompson, which I read in 2020, um, and it's definitely the densest of all of the books that I've mentioned today, and it might be some of some of the densest of just like the history books that I've read in general. Um, and this covers the history of the Polynesian islands. Um, how were they settled? And more importantly, how do we know how they were settled, right? I really like this kind of discussion when we think about history of not only what happened, which is I think the first thing that people think of when they think of history, but how do we know what happened, right? Where did we get the data? Um, and so I think that this is a really interesting book taking you through, you know, cultural anthropology, linguistics, um, geography, um, a whole bunch of a kind of different subject matters as you move your way through time and, and you don't you know you don't really answer the question of how Polynesia was settled until the very end of the book. Um, but I really enjoy that book. That's really fantastic in audiobook format, especially for the linguistic section. And um, I have to I have to quickly mention that one as well. So those are a few of the ancient history books that I've gotten to, um, but I do want to mention a few more on, on my docket. The first is The Crusades, The Authoritative History of the War of the Holy Land, of the Holy Land by Thomas Ashbridge, which is 800 pages of history on the Crusades. And I think if done well, this could be really good. Um, I, I really like reading um, secular histories of religion. Um, maybe I'll do, I'll do a video on that. Um, and so I'm eyeing this one, although I feel like I have to work my way up to taking on an, an 800, 800 page audiobook, which must be like 30 hours. And then the other one that I'm also eyeing is uh, The Storm Before the Storm, The Beginning of the End of the Roman Republic by Mike Duncan, which covers the end of the, um, the Roman Empire, you know, 
the Roman Empire ruled for a really long ass time. So what happened? What were the what were the situations and the politics and the culture that forced the end of that civilization? And did the people living then realize it was like an end, right? Typically that's only something that you ascribe much further down the line when you think back about the events that, that have occurred. And then lastly, I do want to read um, a book about the Vikings because I don't know anything about the Vikings. So I am eyeing River Kings, A New History of the Vikings from Scandinavia to the Silk Road by Kat Jarman, but I know that there's been quite a few Viking books that have come out. So if you have Viking book recommendations, please let me know, or I guess any book recommendations within this kind of genre of ancient history nonfiction. Um, and yeah, if you made it this far, that's really cool. Let's talk about ancient history books. <laughs> I hope it was not boring <laughs> and you did enjoy. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking about doing one of these series where I talk about like three or four, maybe five books um, about maybe shipwrecks or secular religion or um, let's see, I've read quite a few books on fires <laughs> recently, um, the impact of fires or um, kind of famous expeditions like mountain expeditions. So I might do uh, a series including some of those and then talk about again the books I've read and then the books that I'm eyeing also within that subject matter. So if that sounds interesting, then I will see you next time. Bye.